Thank you. For members of the public participating in person, please submit a speaker card to the clerk before or when the item begins. For members participating by Zoom, please raise your hand using the raise hand button or uh, star nine on your telephone. Comments will be received first from the public participating in person, followed by those participating by Zoom. I'd like to now call Pledge of Allegiance. Edith, roll call. Steve, can you hear Edith? Yes, I can. I can hear. I can hear you, Heidi. Oh, great. Here. 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 Yes. Here. Here. Okay. Um, we we have agenda um, amendments. We have uh, any agenda amendments. Any amendments to the agenda? None from staff. Okay, very good. Uh, minutes. We need to approve regular minutes from the January 12th, 2023 meeting. I make a motion that we approve the minutes from the January 12th meeting. Do we have a second? Okay. Uh, the meeting minutes are approved. And uh, meeting open to the public. Um, we're going to Agenda item number two is uh, introductions, awards, recognitions, and presentations. We have a presentation by Livermore Amateur Valley Garden Club about century garden signage. Welcome. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Zach Silva. I'm the recreation supervisor of the Pleasanton Senior Center. And I'm here this evening to introduce the Livermore Amador Valley Garden Club. Um, who maintains the sensory garden just outside uh, in Centennial Park, outside the Senior Center. Um, this evening, we have Beth Clark and Nancy Harrington, who are garden club members on the committee um, overseeing the sensory garden refresh. Um, and they're gonna give you a brief overview of the garden club and that project. So. Good evening. Hi there. So thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to you about our project. Um, as Zach said, we're the Livermore Amateur Valley Garden Club, and the, the Garden Club has been in existence since 1984. Um, and we have about 170 members now, most from Pleasanton, Livermore, and Dublin. And our mission is encourage interest in home gardening, um, promote better horticultural practices, promote civic beauty, and actually we work on a lot of civic projects and promote conservation of natural resources. So a lot of our programs will be about uh, drought tolerant plants, that kind of thing. So as Zach mentioned, uh, the sensory garden is in Centennial Park, right on the, the south side of the senior center, just as you walk through the wisteria tunnels there. And it is one of our um, garden club community service projects to maintain this garden. And our, our members work at the garden once a month. We generally have between five and 10 people who, who go and work at the garden for a morning. So just a little history here. So Centennial Park and the Senior Center were being planned in the early 1990s. And at that time, um, some of the garden club leaders approached the city and suggested that a sensory garden be, be included in the plans. And the city was very interested in that. So the city funded the basic structure of our sensory garden, um, put in the irrigation, provided the soils. And the garden club provided the plants and agreed to maintain the garden. And they've been maintaining this garden for over 30 years now. Um, and the garden club continues to fund the plants, supplies, and each month the city will, will bring the trailer um, for our, our green waste, which we really appreciate. We generally fill the whole thing. So we have three raised beds in the sensory garden and two in-ground beds. And this is a picture of 
um, the garden, our sensory garden area and the whole area around there before any planting was done. So last August, some of us in the garden club began evaluating how well our current sensory garden was matching the concept of a sensory garden. And uh, you might be wondering what makes a garden a sensory garden. Well, it's a garden that's really planned so that the visitors who come to it are going to, to have an experience there. They're gonna use their sense, sense, senses, looking around, listening, smelling, touching. Uh, so that they notice things that they were not aware of before. So each plant in the garden is then selected because of a particular characteristic it brings. For example, its smell, color, texture, its shape. Um, and other things, non-plant things can be included in the sensory garden also, like water features. Some people put bells in. Uh, we're lucky enough to have that big fountain very close to our sensory garden. So when we really looked at our garden, we, we determined that it had, had veered away from its focus as a sensory garden. Um, and also we realized there were no signs that identified it as a sensory garden. So our plan is to return to the sensory theme. So we're, we're assigning a, a sensory theme to each of the gardens, vision, smell, touch, sound, we're actually skipping taste because we don't want anybody eating things they shouldn't be eating. Um, so we've planted, we've purchased new plants to follow the themes and we've removed plants, most of the plants that don't meet the theme of that we've now assigned to the beds. And to date, the garden club has purchased about $1,000 in new plants for the refresh project. So the second part is to add some signs. So we wanna put a main sign at the entrance to the garden. Uh, so it'll identify it as a sensory garden and encourage people to explore different aspects of the garden. So we don't yet have uh, a, our sign uh, planned out. Um, we're working with the graphic designer, Kyle Ogden that the city uses. Uh, but this picture here, I'll give you an example of the type of sign we're interested in, where it, it has sensory garden at the top. It's very engaging with the pictures and the text also to invite people into the garden. So based on looking at the cost of this, um, this sign from this, uh, this particular company and also other signs, we estimate it'll cost um, between $2,500 and $3,500. Um, the Garden Club has given us $2,500 uh, to go toward the signage. And we also have applied for a grant from Rotary, which we expect to, to get. Second type, the second type of signs that we are gonna put in the garden is we're gonna put a sign in each of the planting beds that's going to identify the sensory theme for that bed. And that'll tie in with uh, information we might put on this main sign. And also we're gonna have some pamphlets that help to lead people through the garden. And the third type of signs we're going to add are some wayfinding signs that will, they're very simple signs and um, they'll just say sensory garden and have an arrow. And the city is going to provide these signs so that they're consistent with the other signs in the sensory garden. I mean, in the senior center, excuse me. So that, those are our plans, and um, we'd be very happy to entertain any questions you might have. And again, do you have any comments you'd like to share as well? Uh, just that the sensory garden is a love of mine, and uh, it's uh, a love of the seniors uh, there too, because uh, when we're working, they always stop by and uh, tell us how much they enjoy the garden. So uh, I think they'll enjoy it even more when we... Okay. You start with you. Do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. Well, um, I know where the uh, Rotary grant is coming from. Um, certainly, Nancy, you are a big part of that. Yeah. Everybody can't hear me. 
So um, I have enjoyed the Century Garden for years, and I'm I know there have been weddings out there, uh, especially when the uh, foliage is out and blooming. So uh, kudos to you guys, and um, I hope that maybe your garden club might uh, venture over to the Century House, and somebody can trim. <laughs> trim the uh, rose bushes that should have been uh, pruned over a month ago. But um, hey, what can I say? And you and you are uh, very much appreciated. Um, have you thought about approaching friends of Pleasanton Senior Center for any shortfall funds after the whatever, whatever the Rotary Grant doesn't come up with? Um, yeah, so if we, um, if we don't have enough funds between the the two grants that we now have that would be my next step sure, but they're pretty liberal with their uh their oh giving, are so. they well that's yeah. good to know <laughs> um and then lastly do you have anybody from master gardeners that you're partnering with as far as helping with some expertise well we have master gardeners in in the garden club Great. and so um and some of them do work in the sensory garden as well so we we've been keeping people in the garden club um apprised of what we're what we're doing wonderful thank you kira yeah. nothing ramesh so first of all i want to thank you for kind of helping us understand that we have this wonderful project that is going on for so many years so my question is like people like me whom, who are hearing for first time, my request is maybe spread the word so that you have more people to enjoy the nature and all the hard work you guys are doing and appreciate what you guys are doing. Thanks. That's all from my side. Steve, do you have any questions? Um, I did. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. No, I had a question. I think Chuck covered it. I was just wondering what the ongoing... Um, assistance that the Garden Club was receiving from the uh, City of Pleasanton, if any. Well, I think that we're we've established a relationship with with Zach and some others in the city now, and so um, I, Zach's been just terrific helping us get going on the project, and and um, so uh, you know I see a great relationship going forward. That's great. The other, Thank you. The other thing is uh, we're hoping that the city will publicize uh, more about the sensory garden and invite people to drop on by. We uh, believe that this uh, signage is going to make a huge difference uh, for people understanding the kinds of plants and help them. Uh, we're going to label all of the plants too, uh, uh, help them in just determining what plants they might use in their own garden because we only have a water system in the raised beds. The two lower beds have no uh, water system. So. Wow. And that, is that by design? Yes. The, okay, wow. So drought resistant, you take it, and just what, what the environment offers. I have to say that um, I've enjoyed being in that environment many times with my wife. We go there and we stroll and spend some quiet time, solitude. So really looking forward to the signage. And I absolutely agree that um, educating the public will be very helpful. I think that we can get our local press to to do a story on that. That'll be great. We have a photographer. We have the photo guy with uh, the weekly. So I'm sure we'll get some great photos coming in, especially spring is just, just going to blossom. It's going to be amazing. So thank you so much for your thank presentation. You. Beautiful. Okay, we're going to move on to item number three. And that is public comment from the audience regarding items not listed on the agenda. We do, in fact, have a speaker tonight. And we have uh, Sharon Pekarski. Oh, that's for four. For four. Okay. So we that is specifically for four. Sorry about that. My mistake. Um, so we don't have, um, do we have any any public speakers on, on Zoom? Uh, Patricia Jokey. Oh, there is one. Yes. Okay, very good. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, okay. And um, our speaker, um, and that's by phone? Is that by phone? By Zoom. We have Zoom. Patricia I'm Jokey. Sorry. Zoom, we don't have, but we're not going to be able to see that then, correct? Okay. Um, so our speaker, our speaker, would you please um, give us your name and uh, the topic that you'd like to speak on? We'll give you three minutes. 
Good evening. Hi, my name is Patty Jokey. And um, so I'm a 24 year resident who is uh, active and really passionate about giving back to our community. And I'm currently doing that as a UC Master Gardener of Alameda County. And it's kind of apropos that I'm speaking on this and you guys just heard about the wonderful work the Garden Club is doing. Um, tonight I wanted to share with you that the UC Master Gardener's incredible edible plant sale, which will be in full swing here in Pleasanton at the Senior Center, is beginning on March 19th, where you can actually go through and place your order for vegetables to grow for this, this spring and summer at our online store, which is the, the website is the incredible edible plant uh, Our website is live right now. So you can go and preview over the 110 different varieties of vegetables we have to offer. Um, we have tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers, some herbs, squash, peas, beans, and edible flowers. And they're all $4 each. The proceeds of our sale go to fund the programs we have to offer. For example, we do classes and talks and demonstrations on growing healthy vegetables, sustainable gardening, uh, native plants and drought tolerant plant plantings are just a, a few of the plethora of classes we have to offer. All of our offerings and classes are free to the public. So please come join us. Um, as part of the plant sale, we're also going to have a browsing sale for those who are not able to go through and be included in the pre-order process. So if you miss out, um, please stop by the Senior Center and see us. And a, a tiny bit about our process for ordering and pickup. It's the same as last year. You pre-order beginning March 19th through March 26th, and you pick up your order curbside outside the Senior Center on April 1st or 2nd between the hours of 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. each day. So last year, we held our sale at the Senior Center also, where we sold over 4,500 plants with a profit of about $21,000 for our organization. And we hope to do this well, um, weather permitting, I have to include. In closing, I'd like to thank you for at the I'd like to thank the commission for helping us establish our sale at the, at the Senior Center while we wait for our permanent location as part of the Burnell Park Community Farm. Until then, we hope to be at the Senior Center because it offers an accessible, efficient, and convenient spot for curbside pickup of plants by our customers. If you stop by the Senior Center, you'll see our white hoop houses on the shuffleboard court where we house over 6,500 plants and all of our supplies. We're eager for our permanent location and dream of what we could do for our community when we establish a home base here in Pleasanton. I wanna thank the commission for your continued support and we hope to see you at our sale. Again, the website is the Incredible Edible Plant Sale, or our direct link is acmg.ucanr.edu. Thank you very much for your time. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. I will definitely, I, I earmarked that this morning. I talked to my wife and said, we're going. So I said, we're, I sent her a text. I said, we're having a date. So I'm there. <laughs> Man. Wonderful. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Presentation first, then questions from commissioners, then the speakers, then comments from the commissioners. Good evening, Parks and Rec commissioners and uh, Chair Vickers. I'm Pamela Ott, and I am the assistant city manager here for the city of Pleasanton. Um, some of you might know me from my previous role as our economic development lead, um, but just really happy to be here and share with you this evening some information about a new initiative that the city is undertaking and then solicit any input you have on that. So what I'm here to speak with you about this evening is the new citywide strategic plan process that we're about to, well, that we've actually just started um, putting into place, and then how that relates to the council's work plan and the list of priority items, because the two really do come together and dovetail, and we'll talk through that in a few minutes. 
but I'd like to overview the strategic plan so that you as the Parks and Rec Commission um, really understand what it is that we're engaging on, because this is really intended to be a community wide effort. And we hope that all of you choose to be engaged in your role as Parks and Rec Commissioners, but then also personally, right, and, and share with your network the work that's happening around the strategic plan. And our intent here um, with this very first strategic plan that, that we're doing here for the city is to help to bring focus and clarity to the current city council priority setting process, develop a longer term plan that considers budget, staffing, infrastructure, and project timelines, and provide an integrated, consistent, and continuous approach to planning. Um, for those of you who have been uh, familiar um, with the council's um, priority setting session prior to the start of this new citywide strategic plan process. Um, it was on a two year cycle and it was intended to coincide with the development of the city's two year budget and then our capital improvement budget. But over time, um, that list of items got pretty significantly long. I think we're up to about 78 items on the work plan now. And at the time those items were put on there, they were all important projects to the community, but they weren't necessarily bound by financial constraints or by staff constraints, right? And, and we recognized over time, while it was great to, to capture all those ideas, um, maybe there was um, some setting of expectations that when an item got put on the work plan, it was going to to be completed in that two-year time frame, and we just aren't able to accomplish all that given the, like I said, the financial resources and the staff resources that we have. So we've really been thinking a lot and, and went to the council last November and, and talked to the council about whether there was an opportunity to re-envision the process that we go through. Um, also to, to, to one, try and make that priority setting uh, really much more comprehensive um, and understandable and bound by our resources, but also to make sure that the entirety of our community was engaged in helping to provide input to that process, right? Reaching out in ways that we hadn't necessarily done in the past to make sure that our new citywide strategic plan represented who we are today and who we want to be five years from now. And that's the time horizon for the citywide strategic plan is about five years. Um, we'll still have two-year budgets like we do, and we'll still plan on our capital improvements for approximately a four-year time frame, but looking out a little longer so that we can plan ahead for when these things are going to be delivered to the community. Um, so as I um, skip to the next slide and start talking about some of the key elements in the strategic plan, really developing mission, vision, and values um, that reflect who we are as a community, um, setting multi-year goals and strategies um, that, again, talk about that budget analysis, and then coming up with an implementation action plan for when those priorities can get implemented. And then um, I've just shared with you for a minute or so, uh, really uh, supplanting the current city council priority plan process um, and creating a new process that's reflective of um, who we are and how we wanna plan for today and tying those to some pretty overarching goals for the community. Um, also very intentionally, we are looking at our opportunity to do some inclusive engagement with this uh, strategy that we're laying out. Um, it's really important to all of us working on this project, and I think to all of us in the community, that we're making sure that we're doing collaborative decision-making and engagement that helps to ensure that the final plan represents all perspectives and all experiences of staff, of the council, of our commission and committee members, and of the community. Right. Equity and inclusion are woven into every aspect of the strategic plan, and we are diligently trying to apply an equity lens to help ensure that all the policies that come out of this serve the entire community. Uh, we do have a number of upcoming engagement activities that I wanted to briefly cover with you. You'll see on the left side, February, March, uh, some of those we've already started. Um, the staff here at the City of Pleasanton provided some initial gap analysis information to the consultant that we're working with. Um, starting Monday, March 13th, we are launching something new for us, us, which is a community budget survey as we think about building the next two-year budget, right? And we want the community to weigh in on where they think some of their interests are and where our priorities ought to be in, assign in allocating those financial resources. And we're going to do an employee strategic plan survey of all of our city employees. And we're going to be talking to our middle management group and getting them to provide some feedback because they're often the folks that are on the ground 
providing and doing all the work to deliver the programs and services that we provide to our community. And then also we are gonna host a community budget meeting virtually in late March. Um, then moving into April and May, really moving back out into the community more, um, more deeply. We've got two pop-up events at community, uh, two pop-up events at community events we're thinking about. I know we're looking at two um, Saturdays at a farmer's market, plus a number of other activities that we can participate in. Um, a number of focus group with uh, different um, groups in our community, be that business or be that uh, community-based organizations or any of the um, our partners here and any of our residents that we want to hear particularly from, and then a town hall meeting as well. Then we move into the summer and we'll do a strategic planning workshop internally, and then we will bring all of that information that we've collected over these number of months to the council at a strategic planning workshop to be planned for August timeframe. And then looking ahead at September and October, uh, council's adoption, their consideration and adoption of the strategic plan. Um, and it is um, very uh, specific that uh, Becky Hopkins, my colleague and I are coming around and talking to all the commissions and committees because you all engage with us on the city staff side and then liaise back out to the community. And we wanted to make sure that all of our commission and committee members were very aware of this process and not just aware of the process, but as I said earlier, engaged in the process and talk to your networks and encourage all of the folks that you know to get engaged in this process too. So. Um, very intentional that we're coming around um, the, this month and a half just to make sure that everyone knows what we're doing and everyone feels um, feels in the know and aware of, of these plans. I'm going to move on to the draft council priorities and how that is um, being thought about differently and how that might be shaped. But what I want to tell you is in order to get to a new priority setting process that's part of the citywide strategic plan, we needed to put um, a placeholder on our existing city council work plan. That work plan was due to, to end, if you will, um, this June, but we know it's going to take us longer than that to get through the citywide strategic plan process and understand what the goals and strategies are that come out of that process. So the council has uh, said that they will um, create what they're thinking about as an interim year for the existing council priorities work plan um, that we can then look forward to seeing how much we can accomplish in the next year to see how many items we can really um, get done so that we can look at the community and the council and say almost all of these things have been achieved in, in that extra year that we have. So as I mentioned earlier, we have about 78 projects on the current council party work plan with about 26 of those remaining. So we've done we've done a, a fair amount of work right in two years, especially given that we were coming out of COVID. And what we're looking at now is a lens that says the projects that we have remaining, are they fully funded? Um, if so, great. If not, um, can they be funded? And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, can they be completed either by this fiscal year that we're in or at least by the end of next fiscal year, which ends June 30th of 2024? And then if we do need additional funds for these projects, is there money available in the general fund to be able to allocate to them? Um, so as we move into talking about what's left on the plan, I do want to tell you that staff went through this exercise and we took that list of 78 and we looked at it and we went through and we, we put them into different columns. So we took all the projects that were completed, put them over in the completed column. We took a whole bunch of projects that were on the city's council work plan, but really should be included in the city's capital improvement program because they are capital projects that need to get done. So we haven't lost them. We just move them into the appropriate place where they live so that they can get funded appropriately as part of the CIP. Then we took the rest of the items and we said, okay, can they get done by this year or can they get done by next fiscal year? And that's really how we're thinking about the, the holistic list that the council adopted two years ago in 2021. But before I tell you about the ones that are remaining, I want to talk to you about the ones that the Parks and Rec Commission um, presented to the council and recommended so that you have a sense of what's been accomplished. And my, my guess is that you've 
talk about these quite frequently. And you all as Parks and Rec commissioners probably know where you stand on all these projects, but really just wanted to quickly go over them and let you know that I recognize that you had a particular hand and bring some of these to the council's work plan. And so the Century House, I know, was on your list of recommended projects. Um, and as you know, that's been fully funded and is ready to initiate work on that project. Um, implementation of Lions Wayside in Delukey Park's master plan. Um, that did come to the council very recently. We had a master plan and the council asked us to pause while they got some additional information on the costing side, um, we understood that the price tag for the the entirety of the master plan for Lions Wayside and Delukey Park was pretty extensive. Um, our engineer estimated that somewhere between 12 to $14 million in the council as you likely know, said, can we go get some other cost estimates for something that feels um, more like a renovation rather than a, a redo of the entire park? But I want to let you know that, that that is paused, but the council did talk about that recently. And we'll continue to work on that project on the staff side. Um, and then cricket pitch and fields, uh, fully funded, underway. And I understand that up after uh, my presentation this evening is our landscape architect, Matt Gruber, who's going to talk to you about uh, the cricket pitch that's coming to Ken Mercer. So um, know that, that, that we think that that certainly will be um, largely completed um, by the end of this year. And then also, I do know that the Parks and Rec recommended the Ken Mercer Skate Park, which has been partially funded. Um, and then the council had some conversation in some direction that given the price tag of that project, um, asked staff to, to go back and look at the project again and see if there were opportunities to, to do a little value engineering on that project to see if there is a project that we could deliver with the funding that we have available. And then the All Abilities Playground, um, the plan, that master plan was completed and accepted. And so those are the, the projects that I know. Heidi, I'm, I'm certainly aware that you work with the commission more than I do. And if I've missed anything, please let me know. Great. All right, so moving on to the items that remain on the council's work plan priority list. Uh, we, we told you we have 11 of those here. Um, and you can see by looking at uh, the screen, there are um, about five of them. There are five of them that are not fully funded. And then the other um, six are funded. So you can see on the column funding already allocated. Um, those are remaining and that's already been um, taken care of. And then there are uh, five, as I said, that need to be, and we'll talk about these in a little more specificity. Um, so breaking those into the two columns, um, you can see that uh, level one, we've got funding for and level two, um, we do not have funding for, but what we would like to do is go back to the council and say, council, we've taken our best guess at costing what these remaining items would be. Um, and we think that this is what they are, about $50,000 for the pilot use of an alternative pesticide management treatment at a designated park, um, about $100,000 for the development of an ADA transition plan development of a plan to reduce homelessness in Pleasanton, about $75,000. And then updating the affordable housing fees is estimated to be about a $100,000 project. You notice there are only four on this list, and I told you that there were five. And that's because the fifth one is an update to utility rates and connection fees. Um, and that's got about $180,000 estimate to it. But that will be paid from the Water Enterprise Fund. So it will not come out of the general fund. Right. So the the concept is that we would go back to the council and say, council, these are the items that are remaining. Um, we would like the council to consider if they could find um, that extra 300, I think it's $325,000 to cover the four that are not funded, plus the, the projects that are funded, if the council is interested in considering um, funding the remaining 11 projects that we're talking about this evening for about $2.5 million. And you can see, um, I've shared with you that the 180,000 comes out of the Water Enterprise Fund, and then that leaves about 325,000 that needs to be allocated additionally from the general plan. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the significant reasons that we're coming to each of the commissions and committees is I recognize that um, this is the list that already exists, right? In the past, commissions have been asked to make recommendations to put on the list. We're extending this existing list by a year. So this is the list that already exists, but the opportunity to largely complete the list is really compelling given that we had 78 items on it. And while you as the Parks and Rec Commission may not see items 
things that you specifically requested or worked on on the list. It's really intentional that we wanted you all to know that we value your input and wanted you to be a part of this process all along. And so the recommendation that we've been asking that we are making of each of the commissions and committees that we visit is to provide a recommendation to the council um, about your interest in adopt adopting the rest of these draft council priorities for the fiscal year 23 and 24. And so that's the presentation, but I am um, certainly available for questions, comments, and whatever the discussion on the part of the commission is. Excellent. Commissioner Brown, questions, comments? Um, yes. Just a reminder, questions first, then public comment, and then comments. Questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, in in the engagement activities where you were outlining the different um, activities out there, where where do you see the commissioners participating and playing a part? So I see the commissioners playing a part in all of the the community events as a commute as a commissioner and as a resident. So I certainly see that there's an opportunity. There's also um, several touch points with the council that I think the commission might be really interested in tracking or providing um, additional information. Um, we do know on the staff side that that in our effort to keep you all informed, um, as we find touch points and have enough information to provide back to you about how the plan is shaping up, um, we would look to do that through, through the staff and presentations to the commission. Thank you. And then I did have some, just some general questions about those four projects. Is that um, Absolutely sure. happy to certainly. Um, so from the the pesticide, what is currently wrong with our current pesticide? I'll take a stab at that. There's nothing wrong with our current pesticide okay. management. There was uh, an interest from the community in creating an alternative pesticide park to see what that would look like. Um, they often look very different than the manicured parks that ours look like. And there was a contingent of people who would like us not to use pesticides at all in the parks. And so this would be kind of a pilot project, one specific park where we tried alternatives to our standard pesticides um, so that people could see what that really looks like, because it is a very different look and feel than Pleasanton's used to. Okay, thank you. And then on pr uh, project seven with the develop a city ADA transition plan. So, um, and I noticed that in, even in the reducing homelessness plan, these are your 100,000 and 75,000. Are these actionable plans that we get from there? Or like, what does a, what does a plan come out of it of like, um, they are so much money, you know, I mean, is it, how does that, how does that work? Thank you for the question. They are actionable plans um, that they are largely to hire consultants to help us do the work. So if you think about the ADA transition plan, um, cities need to have, from a risk management perspective, mm -hmm. need to have transition plans in place uh, that is related to ADA. So this one would be to hire a consultant to work with the city and look at all of our city facilities from an ADA lens and help us understand where we need to make adjustments or improvements, right, to, to any of our facilities. And so that $100,000 goes toward a consultant that helps us develop a plan that we can then implement. That's the same for project eight as well. Like those are just, right. those are developing hiring the consultant, developing the plan, and then there'll be a price tag associated to whatever plan that comes back. With implementing the plan, correct. And the okay. plan for homelessness, right? Um, there is a lot of work done in this area, right? I know that we are participating with other cities, uh, Dublin and Livermore, right, on the Tri-Valley Needs Assessment that feeds into the information we need for a homelessness plan. Um, but we have, the councils asked us to work on this project, and I think there's a lot of work to do around sharing with our community some of the activities that we might choose to be engaged in to uh, support or to um, help reduce homelessness, mm -hmm. right? And getting community understanding and engagement and figuring out where those gaps in service are for us and how we might have an impact on that here in Pleasanton. Okay. Um, and then on project 10, um, it says uh, affordable um, housing nexus fee study and updating affordable housing fees. Does that mean that's more fees? So wouldn't this pay for itself? Like, like if, so I'm trying to understand what it means by, by that. Again, it's a consultant to help us. There is a very 
a technical equation that goes into the development of affordable housing fees, which we already have in place, right? But time to time, we are um, improved by going and looking at the fees that we set and making sure they're appropriate for what we're doing today and the costs we're bearing today, and then making decisions at, at the policy level for the council. So this is a consultant to go do that very technical work to assess where we are today, where we might be given the, the equations that they need to look at, and then come back with a recommendation that we would bring to the council to make sure that our fees are commensurate with what we think is appropriate for today. Got it. Okay. I understand. So thank you. That was all my questions. Sorry, so many. <laughs> oh, excellent. Uh, Commissioner Fields. Okay. Um, thank you, Pamela, for your information. Um, if you may... Can you go on mic? You mentioned uh, that um, some of the uh, actual park and rec um, projects have been, um, their programs have been funded, uh, but with no costing on, uh, uh, on them. So I would uh, ask, uh, and I think the Century House is one point something million, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> Um, and, um, we have about $4.6 million for that project at this point. Okay. And that wouldn't, that would be complete. So we would design it to fit within that project budget. Yes. Okay. That's the and, intention. um, when, it, uh, and there's no date to that, for that to be set to start. Our hope is to start the RFQ process this spring and have a consultant on board by late summer and really dive into that design process with the consultant that would include a historic architect. Okay, and I think we've already been notified that of that. And my concern is the longer we wait to uh, facilitate some of those actions, the more it's going to cost. Um, so on the um, skateboard park, we have some of that um, funded. Yes, my understanding is we have about $6 million funded. I think that's correct, but I can get back to you if I'm incorrect, I will let you know. Um, I think it's about $6 million and the plan is to, Matt's here actually, let's have Matt answer this. <laughs> So currently with the skate park, we have 3 million funded out of uh, expected 6.4 million. And we're looking to fund the rest of that as part of this CIP um, cycle that we're going through right now. And uh, is that with uh, any different uh, renovations being changed, the plans, or is it to be what we originally approved? So the original concept that the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, reviewed and approved was uh, about $9 million. And council said, what could you do to construct the park for about $6 million? And that's our goal right now. And that's what we're designing to is what we can get for about $6 million. And it did include right now we're looking to include all the skatable areas and and kind of cut out a, a lot of the uh, amenities you know the shade structures the the big seating areas and some of those other things and, and the bathrooms also the bathrooms also would be illuminated the bathrooms would not be a part of the project okay thanks matt you're welcome okay um uh you the the listing on table one, um, I'm having a little concern with, and Pam, I'd already talked to you about it. Um, I, I don't believe that the Park and Rec Commission has dealt in with any of these. We haven't had a workshop or we haven't had any kind of input concerning these items. And I really truly feel that this is the council's or, you know, part of uh, another department other than the park and rec. But with that being said, um, you stated that we um, it's the desire to go out to the community and ask them uh, about the strategic plan. What are you asking them for? Are you asking them for a wish list or what, it, what, it, because I'm, I, we have people here that have the expertise in which to tell 
what can be done with any of these because they've already studied them. And when you open it up to the community, what are we asking them to do? How, how involved can they be? So, um, Joni, if I under, excuse me, Commissioner Fields, if I understand your question, um, I think I need to make a distinction if I wasn't clear. The list that you're looking at today with the 11 items is the council's current work plan, the remaining items that are left, that uh, staff is going to bring to council to see if council has um, the wherewithal to find the the additional 325,000 in funding and, and take council's direction from there. This list will stay and get worked on by staff because it's already been vetted and approved by the council at their last right. party setting okay. session. So this is not part of the strategic plan, right? The strategic plan is a wholly new initiative to go out to the community and ask the community what they think their city government um, should be um, thinking about and working toward delivering to them as this Pleasanton community, right? And so it's intentional that we think about voices and perspectives that we haven't heard from. So there might be some new, very specific projects that come out of that process, but there might also be some higher level goals about community engagement and how we can do that maybe better or more, more robustly. So we imagine we're going to get a whole complement of um, comments and feedback and input from the community, but it's not necessarily go to the community and come up with a wish list that replicates what we did before. It's really looking at higher level goals and priorities that we want, to, that our community is asking us to deliver to them. And will this be in the form of like a workshop, um, a um, meeting that it, there's some presentations done. Will there be category? <clears throat> She'll be asking people to buy into or um, bring back some feedback. I would think about it. Um, so let me answer your first question. Yes, there will be opportunities for anybody to to weigh in. Some of them will be at community events where we have staff at a booth at Farmer's Market, right? And some will be at workshops that we host that we invite the community to. But I would think about it as a funnel where initially we're out just gathering all of the, the comments and ideas that we can. And then as we continue to analyze and assess the information that we get, it is naturally going to um, roll into some common themes, right? And so we will then take those common themes and those common threads and say, this is what we're hearing over and over again from many members of our community. And so we'll start to create goals and strategy around what those common themes are. So I, I feel that it's going to be a funnel where you take lots of information and start to craft it into something that feels like it's really representative of those high level areas where our community wants us to continue to serve them. Okay. And so it will get more refined over time. And then ultimately, yes, there will be um, goals and priorities that the, the community and then the council can weigh in on. So you see this as a one-year project to uh, gather this well, information? Well, we, ha we have the the uh, time frame on warp speed at the moment, because if you noticed on the slide, um, we intend to go back to council in September or October. Um, but I've also um, would say that, that that is our anticipated time frame. Um, and like anything, if we're good at what we do, we're able to to um, understand our community. And if there is a need to, to extend that time frame just a little bit so that we can get to the best plan that we can get to the community, uh, I certainly see that we could go a little bit later in this calendar year, but the intent is to finish it up later in 2023. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Deckard. Um, just a question on the uh, pesticide management. Um, Matt, have we designated at this point which park that's going to be trialed? Or Heidi? So that's a Giacomo project, um, and I do not the believe only, we have a park established the only, yet. The yeah. Only suggestion I would make is we would pick a park that maybe doesn't have a playground structure that doesn't involve doesn't have a lot of kids that are involved with that park, and maybe one that's just uh, more used for practices or or or, or, or older kids sports. So. Um, just a comment on the um, number seven, the Belt Plan of Homelessness. Um, with my other community had some involved with homeless quite a bit. And I think the only way we're going to get at the problem and hopefully it's going to be part of the budget they look at is, is at least having our retainers some mental health experts. Um, 
because uh, you have a situation, just example, the gentleman's in front of Pet Express for the past few weeks. It was the refuge around him is growing and growing into the parking lot. And yet, you know, such a situation like that isn't, isn't being handled. Nobody's going up there, at least as far as I'm aware, to talk to him, finding ways to get services that he needs or housing. Yeah, and, um, this question so, around. So the, I'm sorry. It's the question around. Yeah. Right so now. the question. So that was, my 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 question would be is is there a way to maybe in, uh, envelop into services people that can be on retainer for for mental health. Thanks. I can't to give you a certain uh, certainty on that, uh, Commissioner. But I will say that I hear your comment, and we'll certainly carry that back to the folks that are working on that project. Sorry. Commissioner Rittman. Just one question. So the money, the cost that is predicted for the level two projects, specifically six and seven, is that specifically for consultation and not for the plan that would come from the consultant? It's for both. It's the hiring Thank of the you. consultant that would prepare that plan. So we would come out of that with a plan in hand. Thank you. Commissioner Amadi. Hi, Pam. Thanks for Thanks for the presentation. And I have a couple of questions or maybe I'm a little bit confused to comprehend the changes that is proposed mm -hmm. because we are used to a different model mm -hmm. where we are focusing more on the parks and recs mm -hmm. related projects and prioritizing and working through understanding what are the different wish lists mm -hmm. and ranking them and going through the priorities. Mm -hmm. And this is quite a different kind of an approach, right? And uh, I have a couple of questions uh, to make myself uh, understand better this new process. So if I'm asking any dumb questions, excuse me. I'm pretty sure there are no dumb questions. So first question is like, my understanding is we have a, historically we had two year plan and a 10 year plan. Or something like that, a long term and a short term. So we have a we had a two year budget cycle, and we have a four year um, capital improvement program, and then there is a two year capital budget for the first two years of that four year capital program that track alongside the two year budget. So really, in the past, we've been planning um, functionally, we've been planning for two years and then thinking a little farther out to, to four for the capital projects. Okay. So that is, thanks for the clarification. And uh, today the list of projects that are put here are really for that two years kind of a cycle are going beyond two years. Correct. Right. So as of this June 30th, we would hit the, the end of the second year. Okay. Um, and because we are not finished with the new strategic plan, we've asked the council to let us to continue working on the existing work plan so that we can hopefully get as many of these projects um, and start our new citywide strategic plan and whatever priority process comes out of that sort of clean because we've mostly finished the existing plan. Okay. So other question I have is some of the project I see in this list are at zero dollars. Can you help me understand? Oh. Yeah, certainly. Um, so um, if you're looking at the last two, Ramesh, like the evaluate the model ordinance and amend the city's code to trigger a mandated, that work will be done in-house by staff. So that's why there's no dollar assigned to that. We will not be hiring consultants for that. For the first one, for the model ordinance to enact a single use, <clears throat> we're waiting on um, Stop Waste, our regional partner, to come up with that model ordinance. Then we'll then take in and, and adapt to Pleasanton. And similarly, we just need to, our staff and uh, community development just need to do the work on the mandated trash enclosure. Okay. And uh, other question I have is like uh, we talked, you talked about the uh, focus group being one of the activity. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that group more? Like what exactly that group is made up of and what do they do? So there will be more than one focus group. There will actually be eight focus groups. Um, and that's in addition to all the community engagement that we're doing. Um, 
I mean, to Mati, I don't have the list in front of me. One of them I know will be about business, right? Making sure we hear the voice of our businesses here in Pleasanton. Um, one of them might be from our service providers, our human services providers, right? So that we understand what, what their perspective is. Um, and it would just be a whole uh, grouping of different um, representative groups in the community to make sure that we're hearing all of those perspectives. Okay, thank you. And other question I have is like, uh, about engaging the community in form of a survey, mm -hmm. right? And how are you planning to reach out to the wider audience? Like uh, usually I see very smaller percentage of people participating in the citywide kind of a polar survey. Are we trying to do anything different to get more participation from the from our present and residents or community? We are. We are challenging ourselves not to do um, just what we've done in the past. Um, so, for instance, when we think about the survey or other community engagement um, efforts, uh, we were really successful, Commissioner Ahmadi, when we were developing the climate action plan and the housing element by going out to where our residents are or, you know, members of our community are. So as one yeah. example, we went to the um, Muslim Community Center right on uh, West Las Positas. And we set up a booth one Saturday and sat and talked to everybody that came by, right? Because we just wanted to make sure that we were going to where our residents were. And so certainly we will use all the traditional city channels through our website, through um, social media. So we will continue to do that, but we will look for more ways getting out to farmer's market. And um, I know that we're, we're getting ready to send out um, a community-wide newsletter probably in April, and there'll be information in that newsletter, and that gets mailed to every single household in Pleasanton. And so we'll use that as an opportunity to <clears throat> create awareness and then encourage um, our residents to engage with us either through social media, online, on the city's website, and through a number of other methodologies. And uh, other question or suggestion I have is, at some point, my request is to enhance or allocate some budget to enhance the website of the city compared to the other cities because I feel that it is lit, it needs a little bit kind of update because it's hard to navigate and hard to find the information. And it looks like if you look at other cities kind of uh, websites, they might, they look very engaging and very updated and a lot of information is. This rounds for questions. And comments are for next round. So, do you okay. have a question? Yes. And uh, other question I have is like, uh, like, as a commission, we used to engage in like, get the feedback from the community about the parks and recreation projects, and we used to voice saying that can we put that in as a priority uh, for the city council to consider. At what point? we are getting into that kind of a mode. We are giving the input for the parks and rec specific projects. Like here <clears throat> you put the city staff recommended projects. Mm -hmm. Like at what point we are, you are getting an input from the commission to say, do you have any wish list, which we are getting from the engaging with the community directly, are them reaching out and <laughs> looking at the agenda item? At what point you think we get in and give that input? That is a shift, right? We I recognize that we went to all of our committees and commissions before and solicited feedback and recommendations to the council. And so what you will see now is us going out to the community and saying, what do we as a community collectively want to do and what are our goals and priorities? But I do certainly think that after we get the framework of the strategic plan, <clears throat> will be um, opportunity and um, and opportunities for um, conversation among all of our commissions and committees okay. to continue to, to have those conversations about what we need here in the city of Pleasanton. Because the I, I don't um, presume to know what the strategic plan will look like because we haven't gone to the community and built it yet. But um, it is not, as I mentioned earlier, intended to be a wish list of items. And mm -hmm. so certainly when we set those high level goals and priorities, we are going to need our commission and committee members to help us understand what those projects and those priorities and what those goals are that we're going to do to achieve those those key areas. Yeah, because why I'm asking that question is in the in the recommendation section of this uh, agenda, it says uh, 
commission will provide the recommendation to the city council to adopt the draft council priorities, right? So what I'm understanding from the discussion is there is a next round of discussion that will happen where this commission can give that input from the wish list, kind of add some of the projects which you would like to based on the feedback. Is it what is it right, Matt? So that is that is not uh, where we are today, Commissioner Mahdi. What we're asking you today is if there's interest on the part of the Parks and Rec Commission to relative to the 11 items that are left that we've identified for you to recommend to the council that they fund those and we keep working on those for the next year. Um, the, the process for talking about um, specific projects and items that would then uh, get discussed by the Parks and Rec Commission hasn't been fully formed because we haven't yet developed that new citywide strategic plan. So it's going to take some um, adjustment and flexibility on all of our parts to figure out what that new plan looks like, how it serves all of us, and then how, as commission and committee members, we then are able to do the work to engage with that plan. Because we, the council still needs your advice and your guidance and your recommendations. I just think the ways we've done that in the past are going to shift slightly, and we'll just kind of develop new processes and new opportunities for our commissions and committees to um, advise the council. Okay. And uh, I agree with Joni that all these projects we haven't never heard about it never saw never discussed so i'll that is some one of the concern i have to kind of recommend as a commission like a parks and Rec commission because none of these items we are aware of it are we don't know much about it other than what we are hearing from you so i'll that's all my comments are uh, questions from for now uh commissioner Berberish. Thanks, Mike. So, um, Pamela, good to be working with you again. Um, I think my, a lot of the commissioners asked a lot of questions that I had. I was scratching them off my list as we were going through those. <clears throat> um, one of the questions that hasn't been raised yet is, so to this date, you know, what other commissions or committees have you met with and presented this information to? Or are we the first ones to see this? Uh, good evening. Nice to uh, hear you again, Commissioner Berwick. So uh, I have been to the Planning Commission. I was there last evening. I'm here with you this evening. My colleague Becky has been to the Youth Commission, to the Library Commission, and to the Civic Arts Commission. And so that still leaves Economic Vitality, um, Bicycle Ped, Trails Committee, and Energy and Environment, and Human Services. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little inquisitive about, um, and I know it's early days since you just had several of these meetings recently, but I was wondering what type of feedback they received from this list as well. I mean, I, um, I'm not local, otherwise I'd be on site, but I did speak to a council person today and I was a bit miffed by some of these, the list of items that was on the list. And I was wondering why it was being taken up at our forum. And they didn't get a good answer for that. So I was a little um, little inquisitive about that. Uh, second thing, I guess, um, I guess, how did we come up with the dollar amounts on, prod, on the level two projects? So on the level two projects, the dollar amounts were uh, based on um, either calls that we made to consultants or um, some basic groundwork that we did when we went to estimate the cost of doing those projects, much like yeah, we would I, do when we create our budgets. Sure. And I presume we've gone through competitive bids and we have reputable firms that we work with and we go through this process. So we will. That's not where we are today. These are our placeholders. So when you build the budget, we think this is what it's going to cost us. Um, we would take that. And then when we go do our uh, work to find those competitive bids, then we would understand what the true <clears throat> cost of is. But this is our very um, best educated guess based on the work that we do. Sure. Uh, I have two more questions. One is, um, and I'm and I'm a little curious. What was the twelfth project that didn't make the list? Oh, well, it um, the the twelfth project. There was um, it was Ken Mercer Skate Park, and we had put it on this list. Um, but it, it, we realized it belonged in that CIP column. 
because that's where it's being funded. And so it wasn't on the, 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 um, it was, that's where it needed to live was the CIP. Okay. So the CIP, um, I'm presuming that's the capital projects, pro uh, Correct. Budget. Yes. Okay. So, Correct. so the capital projects would be, cause this really helps me with a comment I was going to make at the comment section. So the CIP project would be the skate park, the Lions Wayside, and then the Century House additional fundings. Would that all fall underneath that CIP budget? Um, Those three projects? Generally, yes. Y yes, Commissioner Berberk, yes. The Lions Wayside would fall under there. Um, the skate park would fall under there. So yes, anything that looks like a, a capital project that we need funding to build gets put into that CIP column or bucket so that we can appropriate sure. fund for that. Okay. <clears throat> and I guess the last question is, you know, I understand that the 78 items are pretty da daunting to try to uh, achieve. It's like, you know, man, you know, objectives, you know, <laughs> for year-end objectives in, in any uh, organization, you know, you only want to work on three or four and you want to make sure that you meet those objectives within the time frame. So I guess the question I have is, where does the Staples Ranch fit? You know, we are, sit on the Park and Rec Commission. Um, you mentioned Lions Wayfair, the skate park, century, um, the Century House. Another item that we were really keen and hot on is the Staples Ranch because we believe that uh, the community would get great benefit out of that with the multiple sports would play there. Where did that fall on the list? So Steve, the Staples Ranch uh, master plan never ended up on a council work plan. It was never prioritized by the Park and Rec Commission to move forward as one of your items. Um, last year, you prioritized the Cricket Pitch, Century House, and Lion's Wayside to go forward to this two-year work plan. So Staples Ranch is really, um, we have an old master plan there and it has not risen to the council priority level yet to go back and look to see what that should be. So um, I do believe that the strategic plan process will be a beautiful nexus for us to look at what the community-wide goals are, where are our gaps, and then what resources we have to potentially fill those to start to think about projects. So I'm sure. excited about that. And Staples Ranch is one of those gems that we have that could be something great for this community one day. But it's just, it's never risen to a council work plan priority. Sure. Okay. And then let me just finish with one last question. Thanks, uh, Heidi, for jumping in. So um, is, is, is this something, if we as a council want to put on their radar or make a priority, should we put this on one of our future agenda discussions or how do we... How do we resolve or resurrect or get the right attention for, you know, this area, which I believe all of our park and rec commissioners would be interested in, rather than looking at level two projects that really have no bearing upon us other than taxpaying citizens with our own personal opinions. Right. So um, I would suggest that, you know, there's not an opportunity in the here and now to have the planning commission offer Stables Ranch to put on a list because there's no list that we're creating at the moment, but through the citywide strategic plan process, there would be an opportunity to, to take in information like that or um, suggestions like that, and then start to see how that comes to bear for the community around um, a higher level goal around community amenities or recreational activities. Sure. Right. Okay, Pamela. Thank Yeah. Thanks for jumping in there. I think I think that the question was really directed to Heidi, whether Heidi, whether, whether this is a question for Heidi, whether we should put this on our pork and rec agenda for a future discussion. I guess that's the, the last question. Yeah, I asked so I Steve, I would wait on that. So really what we're trying to go for here with the strategic plan is to get away from master planning things that we don't have actual resources to implement. Um, so Got you've it. seen Lions Wayside, right? So the idea is that with the strategic plan, we can start to look more globally at the city's resources and then build, instead of wish lists, build a capital improvement budget that's going to grow over time. And then as it starts to have the money we think it's going to need to not only plan, but implement, um, I think that's that's the way we're we're trying to move so we don't end up with plans. And then similar to All Abilities Playground is when I think about, right? We've got this sure. great plan have no money to implement it. So moving away from that. Um, so I would wait until the strategic plan process is complete 
and okay. see what um, what role the council asks us as commissioners to play in in helping develop um, those priorities and how that then folds into the budget. So really, we're wanting to tie all of these pieces together so we can do the work that we say we're going to do. Okay, and I, I totally believe in that approach as well. So I really appreciate uh, the answers by both you, Pamela and Heidi. So I'm, I'm done with my questions. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, sir. We're going to go to the comments section now. Commissioner Brown. A public comment first. Okay, I'm sorry, public comments. I'm sorry. We have one speaker. Please join us. Good evening. Good evening. The City Council recently renewed the Zone 7 agreement to allow us to use their access roads as trails. The agreement requires the city to maintain the improved trail surface. The staff report to the council read in part, these trails play a critical role in the city's trail system and provide both a recreational benefit and non-vehicular travel corridors. Regarding the Alamo Canal and Arroyo de la Laguna trails that parallel I-680 and goes past the planned Costco, it goes on to say, the Alamo Canal Trail and Arroyo de la Laguna Trail provide a connection to Dublin and are a major north-south transportation route for bicyclists, walkers, and joggers. This trail surface includes asphalt concrete from I-580 under crossing to West Las Positas, end quote. In fact, due to a lack of maintenance, this trail has been deteriorating for years, and the section between Stone Ridge Drive and West Las Positas has been returned to Zone 7 standards, which means to gravel suitable for pickup trucks, but unusable for most on wheels and uncomfortable for those walking or running. This trail is especially important because it provides the only way to cross I-580 for miles without walking or riding over a freeway overpass. The trail connects to both the Iron Horse Trail and the Alamo Creek Trail a short distance north of I-580. Bicycle traffic southbound on Johnson Drive will be diverted onto this trail per the Johnson Drive widening project with no southbound bike lane on the street past Costco. The only southbound exit before hitting gravel will take users through the dangerous high traffic volume intersection at Johnson and Stone Ridge Drives. There is no easy or safe way for a bicyclist to get on the trail northbound. Repairing the this trail along with the Arroyo Mocho Trail was a priority sent to the council by the Bicycle Pedestrian Trails Committee during the last priority setting meeting. It was dropped after staff provided misinformation and implied it was too costly. The gravel section of the Alamo Canal Arroyo de la Laguna Trail between Stone Ridge and West Las Positas is about one mile. Last year, Livermore paved a one mile section of Arroyo Trail for $245,000. This section of trail could be improved for a fraction of the cost of recently funded and planned sports fields, courts, and parks, while providing transportation as well as recreational opportunities for everyone from toddlers on a balance bikes to seniors with a cane, not just those with a physical ability or interest in using a sports facility. As the BPTC's parent organization, Please support adding repair of this trail to the work plan. Also, my friend Car Carmelita is here tonight to show her support for this important amenity for her Val Vista neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Very good. And now we go to um, the commission comments. Do you want to see if there's any virtual? Any virtual? Yeah. Anybody on virtual? No virtual. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Brown. Um, yeah, I I guess I had some I actually had some questions about that. I wasn't I'm not that um, but I know it's a comment section. So but um my comments are um 
are in the, uh, for the strategic plan, um, essentially, like, I really like that. Um, I'm surprised um, we actually don't have that already, right? Um, as in the company that I, that I work for and the organizations I do, we have vision, mission, values, we have guardrails and themes. And so um, understanding where things fall into. So like, if we were to take like um, uh, safety being a, a large theme, then maybe then the, the we would the roadway would be something that would bubble up to the top and so i think that um really important and what i also like is how do we measure success so um i think that's really important because we can put all of these things forward but how are we measuring like we we're excited about the cricket fields or we're excited about all the things we put forward but how do we know it's successful or not I mean, we do we do we measure that? Do we know? Do we see what success is um, after, for how much money that we spend on different things? And so, I think that should definitely be um, a critical to having um, these strategic plans. So, really, really like the priority setting and um, and the engagement. So, I look forward to uh, participating in that. Um, as for the different levels of stuff, I mean. Um, uh, yes, it's not something that we look at, but I actually thought it was kind of interesting to read about it and to better understand what some of the other commissions are doing, broadening my own horizons. Um, and I and I I'm assuming that this is just a take it all or leave it all. I did write a little priority list of what I thought was more important. I'll just make a comment um, that I did think things that help the community as a whole, like the ADA um, compliance or homelessness, that those were on like more on the top of my list, as well as then the um, fees to the, um, um, the housing. And then the pesticides didn't really interest me at all, but whatever, some, that's on some people's high list, so. I know no judgment there, but that was my um, that was my comment on that. Uh, so yes, and I run, and I uh, um, going to get ready to run a half marathon. So I need longer trails to run. So so that is important to me as well to be able to um, figure out where I can do a, a thirteen mile run. So being able to run on those types of trails, and I fall a lot. Uh, I, I don't watch where I'm going and when uh, when there's gravel. Uh, so you know. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you are. I good some good fashion Superman uh, role uh, when I'm running. So, um, but uh, yeah, those are my comments. Thank you. Excellent, Commissioner Fields. It, it looks like uh, our current council and our uh, city manager and our staff are looking to revamp um, a a working a project um, to, as we had talked before, uh, these 87 um, wish list items um, just kept snowballing and snowballing and snowballing where nothing was being completed. And as, as a homeowner, you always go, let's do the things that need to be done first. And um, I, 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 I'm a strong believer in that. I'm a strong believer in um, representing the city uh, population as to what makes us strong. I, I think a new strategic plan is, is the right way to go. Um, I do have uh, concerns with this um, list of uh, items that uh, I personally, as a Park and Rec Commissioner, know little about. I do know uh, more about the homeless situation as I'm uh, personally friends of someone who works with that every day. Um, and the um, pesticide uh, treatment, we had talked about that, oh, I wouldn't say easily six months, eight months ago, and had already done a, um, a small project on that already with signage. So I, I feel good with that. But um, as, as far as these other items are concerned, I... Um, I really don't feel um, 
that I am uh, knowledgeable enough to vote yes on these items. I think the strategic plan is a good plan. I think reaching out to our community is an excellent plan because right now I think a lot of people in our community feel that the noisy wheel, the squeaky wheel is the one who's getting the things that are being done. Um, and they don't represent everyone in our community. Um, I do appreciate everyone in the staff that works so darn hard with so very little. And people in our community do not understand that. Um, you know, um, having a police department that still needs more police, firemen, same thing. Our, our park and rec staff being um, down, being trying to get life uh, guards and people to run specific plans in the senior center. I, I, I understand all that. And I think with a strategic plan, you are going to get a um, better feel. But until you get people to buy in, it's not going to happen. So... Um, I appreciate all your work, um, and I, I hope that the strategic plan and our um, other amenities that we want for our city happen. Thank you. Chair Vickers, may I offer a comment? Because I've heard um, a couple of the commissioners um, express some concern about um, their their lack of knowledge, perhaps, or understanding of, of these projects. Um, and I maybe I wasn't clear earlier. So if it would help, um, remember that these projects have already been put on the work plan by the council, right? So the, so the, um, the decision making process is, is on is not about whether they belong on the work plan or not. It's just really a request that says, um, we we understand that there's a variety of items that were on the work plan. And even though some of them may not um, belong or have come out of this, a particular committee or commission that they represent the work that the council thought was important enough to do over the two-year cycle. And so um, I recognize that that it is it does feel um, um, difficult to vote on something that you may not know all the ins and outs of, but really the recommendation or the request is just to say, um, we think that because these things are already on the work plan, that there's an opportunity for us to to agree that they got put on there for by the council for, for reasons that we either know or don't know, right, but can appreciate all the good work and the thinking that went into that and that we'd like to uh, see that there's an opportunity to bring them to completion. So thank you for letting and, me and offer that. To, to that point, I'd like to say that I really appreciate your comments right there because that's dead on target it was some of the questions that i've had of late of you know in the position of mm -hmm. of the commissioners of what is our position here so that really clarifies it for me i hope it does for others as well chuck do you have any uh comments uh, um no no question no comments other than the ones i kind of formed into the question phase on uh, project title uh three and seven so very good okay Comments. Uh, just for in terms of outreach, I think it's important to include the youth. I think that there is a population that would be interested, especially in the high schools. So I would love to see that implemented. Thanks for the feedback. I think uh, the transformation you guys are trying to do is amazing. And the success depends on how much we can kind of motivate the community as part of this process is where the rubber hit the road, right? So I hope uh, we all can collectively make that success and see how this goes, right? But uh, thanks for kind of taking the initiative to change the status quo and make it better for good. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Berberic. Yeah, so um, I guess I have, a, before I make my comment, I just had another question that came to mind and one being in finance. So when it says uh, on this table one, it says funding needed and not allocated. But I think I heard Pamela, you say that these were priorities on the city council and they already agreed to this but are you saying that they haven't agreed to the funding or why 
why is items not funded, but on this list? I guess that's my question before I give my comment. Commissioner Berberick, this goes to the heart of why there's some um, shift in our thinking about the priority setting process. You are correct. There are items that are on the council's work plan that do not have budgeted funds already allocated to those. So of that, those 11 that we presented, a handful of them, so about six of them, I think, did. Um, and then there are four that do not have funding allocated to them. So you are correct. They got put on the council's work plan with the presumption that we would figure out the funding later. And so now that we're at this um, interim stage and that they are remaining, um, we think that with that extra $325,000, if the council so decides that that's where they want to um, allocate funds, that those could be completed. Sure. Thanks. And, and thanks. And again, I wanted to thank you for pointing out that the Wayside Skate Park <clears throat> partial funding for the Century House is fitting in a different budget, the capital project, because I was a little concerned um, early, but you know, you rectified any concern I had there. And I'm happy to hear that um, we're going to be pulling together st strategic plan. And I think those of us on the Park and Rec Commission feel that that's something that we really want to weigh in on to try to get that up on the list at least from our, you know, our own selfish perspective. So thanks for your time. Thanks for an explanation. I think it was very informative. And um, I look forward to that strategic plan when we're about to in, endeavor that process. So thank you. Very good. I want to piggyback on um, uh, Commissioner Berberic's uh, comments there, especially there at the end. Um, as all of you know, on the commission, when I joined this commission, um, I was a little bit confused. And um, I think, and the confusion was that I came into a situation where it looked like we were doing um, a monthly wish list of things that would not be fulfilled. And so I think that this approach going forward is, is, is a, I think, a big step in the right direction so that we may be more engaged in um, the, the cost of a project so that we can really evaluate things on a level of, um, of seriousness that says, um, this is what we'd like to do, but this is the budget that we actually have available. And so what can we do in that budget? Just as all of us do in our families, um, we should be um, taking care of the, uh, the public's money in the same way. That's my comments. I'd like to go ahead and make the motion that we provide a recommendation to the city council to adopt the draft council priorities for fiscal year 2023 and 2024. I'll second that. Okay. And so it is. Um, to vote on that. So motion and second. Edith, would you mind doing a roll call? Thanks. Abstain. Yes. Fields, abstain. Amadi? Yes. I'll vote yes. Yeah, so you have a, your, your motion passes because your um, quorum is three. The motion passes. Thank you very much for your time this evening. It's been uh, fun to, to talk about the strategic plan and to see some of you again. So thank you very much again. While we're switching um, presenters for you here, I would love to share that we are indeed working on an updated website for the city that should roll out I this <laughs> spring sometime. So you don't even need to put that on a wish list anywhere. It's happening. Thank you, Heidi. I, that was on my things to talk about and I forgot. We are, it looks like we have a new gentleman that's joining us, Mr. Matt Gruber. This is uh, item, no, for, for this evening though. He was nice and relaxed on the side there. I saw him just relaxing there. Um, this is item number five. Matt, would you like to take over on this?
Um, you. you have seen me multiple times talking about the cricket pitch. Uh, it's been a really long road, and you'll be happy to hear that this is the last time I'm going to be talking to you about the cricket pitch before we put this out to bid and get this project constructed. And because it's been such a long road, um, I wanted to, or the city wanted to give the Parks and Rec Commission one last chance to talk about um, the construction of the project and make sure that um, you have a chance to provide final input before we finalize the design of the construction documents, because that's where we're at right now, about to finalize the construction design. So tonight, what I'm looking for from the Parks and Rec Commission is for you to review this, this draft construction plan. And really, I'm just showing you the site plan because it's a pretty simple construction matter and, and provide comments to me. So there's no vote or anything that's required. I'm just looking for comments before we finalize the construction plans. And what you have in front of you here is uh, what we had originally presented to you uh, when we're showing you the concept plans. And what you have right here shows um, what we're proposing now, which is almost uh, an exact replica of what you had seen previously. So here's here's the cricket pitch right here as proposed. The infield is this, uh, this little dash line here. And then the outfield of the cricket field is this dash line. Um, with the proposed improvements, we're looking to remove the hardball infield, which is what you see here, and the, the dugout and the backstop, and we'd replace that all with new grass. Um, we'd install the 78 by 10 foot pitch. It would be a concrete pad with synthetic turf uh, adhered to the pad, and um, we would be making the necessary irrigation modifications for the, the cricket pitch. Um, and one thing I want to talk about real quickly is we've been working with the synthetic turf manufacturers to determine what is the proper synthetic turf to use for the cricket pitch and how how that should be adhered and what the, the base layer of that synthetic turf should be. And that's why we landed on the concrete, because um, the pile height, which is the term they use for the, the height of the, the synthetic turf, for cricket, it's it's really, really short. Um, it's, it's, I think it's about three eighths of an inch thick. While if you're talking about like a soccer field, you're talking two, two and a half inches. So, um, that's why you need the concrete to adhere the turf to rather than having like, a a class two um, ag aggregate base or permeable material for the base. Um, I'm just going to talk really quickly about the, the pitch you'll, you'll see this this is not really large, so my apologies, but the cricket pitch is going to be um, a basically concrete base with a thickened edge so that um, we make sure it's stable and doesn't move. And um, and we were talking about, at least the designer originally proposed, putting in a, a, a little pocket for the wickets for cricket. And um, I'm going to talk about that in a second here. Um, and we actually reviewed the plans and we made some recommendations, which are um, number one, to minimize the impact to the surrounding parks and fields. So one of the ways we're gonna do that is, um, you know, potentially shifting or not potentially, but planning on shifting the soccer field to the north. Uh, I think that's field six there. Um, and we would shift it to the north and there is room to shift that field. And that gives us a little bit more flexibility potentially to, potentially rotate the cricket pitch a little bit. Um, I think we could probably shift that soccer field uh, about, if you could see this, I don't know how well you could see it, but the the, the field line is actually right at the edge of the, the infield there. So we could probably get somewhere between 15 to 30 feet uh, and to shift that field. And we need at least eight feet for the soccer goal. So it doesn't interfere with the pitch. So we got some flexibility to maybe rotate the pitch because it's not currently the ideal orientation. So that's maybe one thing I would be looking for input on. Um, but we're also looking to relocate this soccer pad right now because there's not really any reason for this, this soccer goal pad to be here. And we've talked to the soccer groups and we're going to look to shift this piece 
all the way over to where the, the existing soccer fields are to the west and use this pad potentially for cricket storage. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I already talked about shifting the field. So that, that's, that's basically it with this project. Um, as I said, we're really just looking for the Parks and Rec Commission's comments on this and just make sure we incorporate what you comment on into the final plans, which are the next step. Let's do a double round. Let's go um, questions first and then comments. So uh, Commissioner Brown, any questions? No, I'm good. Okay. Commissioner Fields? Um, I would ask that Ramesh give us some input on your recommendations um, because he's our guru of you know, of cricket pitches. So uh, I'm sure that you've already talked with him. We we will definitely be looking to get input from uh, both uh, Commissioner Amadi and Commissioner Berber, along with all the other commissioners. Um, I know there is a keen interest on the commission in, in the cricket field. So uh, that's definitely a big reason why we're here tonight. Okay. Um, I, I personally don't know a thing about cricket. I've gone and watched, but I don't know anything. And so I would uh, refer any questions along with to Ramesh and Steve. Thank you. And one thing I don't, I don't know if I, I mentioned this, but you could see we are proposing to remove the wicket pocket and we are proposing to not put in permanent striping on the cricket pitch so that there's there's actually a product that is a temporary striping that is like a long-term temporary striping where you could take it on and take it off it's kind of like a when you stripe a grass soccer field or grass field um, and we're proposing that's what we use instead of permanent striping on the edges because it allows different age groups to play at different times no, I just applaud staff and, and everybody engaged with this. I think it's been well vetted and, and gone over several times. And a lot of options considered, so uh, I have no other comments. No, thank you. So, Matt, uh, thanks for uh, the information and uh, rendering. So, a couple of uh, suggestions or questions I have. One is, I uh, want to thank you. This is a too big a field for, for a cricket. Like usually even the World Cup, the field size is about 100 to 120 yards, uh, which is about 300 to 340, 360. This is, this is too big. So we can definitely have adults game there that is a good thing and why i'm kind of bringing that is uh, if you want to kind of reduce the playing area and that if that helps to kind of change the orientation of the pitch like something for you to keep in mind Even like for example like uh, emerald glen the cricket pitch at emerald glen is less than say like 150 feet to 200 feet so compared to that we even like at san ramon fields are about 150 200 max so this is way big then like it's good that it's big so that there's no like a risk of ball eating any pedestrians or getting into the house or anywhere so it's uh, i really appreciate uh you kind of considering that and giving the maximum what you can, but if it helps to reduce and fix the orientation because the orientation is uh, is in line with the sunrise and sunset, it if you can move it a little bit of north as much as you can, that helps uh, with both the pitcher and and the striker. And other thing is like uh, the pitch length. I suggest like uh, if we can, if possible, because what happens is uh, there is a transition. The pitcher runs from the grass and he gets on the cement concrete pitch. 
we need more the transition length to get on the pitch and before he bowls it's better otherwise there is a chance that he may trip kind of at the edges so my suggestion is to if possible increase that 78 feet to 90 or 100 if possible 100 ideal but at least 90 feet and uh, Commissioner Amadi, could I ask you a question? Would you split the addition of the, the linear feet on both sides or would yeah. you? Okay. See, since we are not doing any striping yeah. or holes, like whichever end you add it, it's going to be same, right? And uh, other question I have is, uh, is it going to be a a single kind of a piece of slab because in in San Ramon they did two or three pieces like there is a gaps in this 80 feet or 70, 80, 80, 78 feet they put like 30 by 10 30 by 10 30 by 10 and they put a reaper or some bar uh, wooden bar in between that really is messing up uh, because if ball is pitching on that specific area, it is kind of hazardous. So my suggestion is to make sure it is a single layer, like do not split that slab of 78 by 10. And uh, other than that, uh, thanks uh, for all your due diligence. And uh, and definitely another other thing I saw somewhere, if I correct me if I'm wrong, if I got it, you are comparing this to the Emerald Glen pitch. Correct. The difference between my understanding with Emerald Glen pitch is a DG, not a cement. It was more about the length of the pitch okay. that okay. the Emerald Glen comparison was made. But uh, did you consider uh, putting a DG because it has its own advantage because water can percolate and uh, whereas cement, the water is not going to seep through it, right? You will see the puddles and the grass will die uh, throughout the perimeter because of the water, right? So my suggestion is uh, consider putting the DG, then the cement pad. We have two or three, two cement uh, pads in the San Ramon. We see the same problem where the water is kind of flooded the parameter and the water, the grass is kind of gone within one month of their maintenance, right? So it will, the whole, it becomes a little bit uh, dangerous uh, and also look and feel like it looks like it's wear and tear across the perimeter, around the perimeter. So my suggestion is consider if possible to go for DG, which is kind of good uh, for the community cricket and it helps like a uh, percolate the water through it rather than having the puddles uh, throughout the perimeter uh, of the pitch. So those are the, my comments or suggestions. Thank you. Commissioner Bugart. Uh Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Mike. So yeah, I have, uh, I have no questions. I only have a lot of praise for the staff. I know this is something that's been going on. Um, well, actually it's been going on um, as far as I'm concerned for the last five years. But um, since I've been on the commission, I really saw this project move forward. And I really thank um, Heidi, Michelle, Matt, and I know you guys will do a great job on this the same way you did on the um, pickleball court. So thank you very much. I'm sure everyone in Pleasant appreciates it. And, you know, with changing demographics in our city, you know, it needed to be in the sports park and um, Ken Mercer Sports Park. And so all kids can play whatever sport they choose. So thank you very much. Excellent. Um, I have no questions. Do we have any other comments? Because I know that first round I said questions. Yeah, so just see if there's any public comment first virtually, okay. and then we can do comment. Anybody in public? No public comment. Thank you. Mike, can I uh, ask one more? Sure. So is there any bleachers or anything planned for the players to sit down there around the field 
We don't currently have plans for bleachers, but if that's a request, that, then that should be a common yours and we could look into adding bleachers. Or my request somehow. is if it kind of can be accommodated within the budget, my suggestion is at least have one or two bleachers for the players to sit down because it's a long game and uh, there'll be some parents if and kids to sit down for four to six hours. Yeah, that definitely yeah. could be a request of yours. And I, I think there's existing bleachers and existing benches for the, the baseball field where uh, the field we're demolishing. So that's something we could definitely look into. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. Comments section. Yeah, so um, this looks really, really great and exciting. I'm I'm actually glad it's bigger because I think there was a lot of public comment around safety and, and concern. So giving that bigger, bigger area, I think provides that. And so, um, yeah, looks really great and excited to, uh, we'll have to go all play a game when, uh, when it gets out there, right? I'm, I'm not sure I can commit six hours uh, to a game, but maybe we can do it. <laughs> A smaller one, but uh, this that looks fun. Excited. I've heard games can take a lot longer than six hours. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Let's see. Okay, Commissioner Fields. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, I think the whole department has worked so very hard to find a um, agreeable space, and thanks to all the different sports groups that have um, worked together for the accomplishment of this, this pitch. Um, it, it's amazing that we, we got it through. There was so much negativity to start out. And now I, I see this as a, a nice little diamond. So thank you. I mean, you, you've done, you and uh, all the rest of the staff have done a great job. Thank you. Yeah, along that line, uh during sports during sports council um there i was just really surprised by the all the different sports groups rage and ballistic and how much they all were behind this cricket pitch it, it's it, and what whatever they had to do to accommodate they almost went um more forward than they had to 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 make it all work so i, I think it was just it was a complete effort from everybody to make this as after uh effort that we made at Mirwood that didn't go as well as, as we expected. It's nice that we regrouped and uh, made a success at Sports Park. That's it. No comments. Thank you for all your work. Dedicated comments? Yeah. So as uh, as Joni and uh, Chuck pointed out, like it's uh, great to see every sports user group rally behind their support uh, for something uh, a upcoming sport and and we need to really kind of commend their support and come uh, like commander <clears throat> to kind of support and accommodate specifically and give away their field for some other sport and uh, other thing is uh this is uh i want to thank all the previous staff only person who is constant on this project is matt <laughs> for last six years right and and uh, all this, I want to thank Heidi and Michelle and uh, all the previous staff members who rallied support and tried to provide the field. Finally, it is coming to the fruition and I feel this is the right place and uh, everything happens for good. That's what I believe. It's uh, slower, but I think it kind of going to end in a right place uh, with a lot of support from the community. And uh, I'm happy to see the size of the field, which will kind of put everybody in a safe kind of a situation. And uh, even the international players, I never saw even, I said like uh, international stadiums where about uh, 115 to 100 yards, which is 300. This is way, way bigger. So I'm really happy to see that it came really well and it will put everybody in a safe situation and in a pleasant. Thanks a lot, Matt. I know it's a long journey, <laughs> right? But uh, Thanks a lot for all the help from the staff. You're welcome. And if I could just ask one question here, since you mentioned bleachers, um, I'm just I'm just going to ask if you if you could provide me some. Um, let's see if that comes up on the screen again. Hold on a second. 
Uh, if you could provide me with a, a, a recommendation on where you you think those bleachers should be. There we go. I suggest. Uh... Um, so currently, you know, we have bleachers here and here, but that's not the location that they sh should be. There, we can't see. It. Oh yeah, sorry. Currently, there's there's bleachers here and, and here, um, which would be in the outfield area. And so, Ramesh, you know, we have this pad that's not going to have soccer goals on it anymore. So that's a potential location for bleachers. And I, I would probably ask you if there's other materials that Cricket may want to store and maybe put a storage area. But that's what this area is for, is potential future storage for the club. Um, but as far as putting these bleachers somewhere that doesn't interfere with, you know, soccer, are, are you thinking kind of along this pathway or where yeah, would you that, think? That's what my, okay. that's where I'll put. And the other question I have is in general, like a knack box, right? Does the city of Pleasanton needs to be placed on the slab or it can be placed on the dirt, like a, on the ground for the, for the knack box to store a small nag box with three by six by three feet height. What is the city's requirement is? It doesn't need to be on a concrete pad, but it would be better if it's on a concrete pad. Um, usually if we would put it in like a decomposed granite or infield area, we would put some type of footing on it or have some kind of pins in the ground for it. Um, but if it's a pad, we could just surface mount the knack box to the pad so if that's a request that we look into including a knack box for storage we could yeah investigate yeah. that too and do you know the dimension of the existing slab i believe it's about 12 feet by 30 feet it's pretty large wow yeah okay i think uh, please uh, my request is to consider adding the knack box or padding and let the user group around what are the requirements, how they kind of do that. My request is to make sure we have some for, for the NAC box as well as bleacher. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, oftentimes that NAC box can sit right behind the bleachers there. You have a, a, a small rise of bleachers and that, that box just fits right in that backspace there. Just my comment. Uh, Steve out there in Pennsylvania, what do you got? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so thanks Chuck and uh, Joni for bringing it up. I was really impressed um, by the um, collaborative approach from the sports console. And I think um, we should all give them kudos as well because um, everyone's kind of looking after their own turf, but you know, everyone came, knew this was the right thing to do and wanted to do the right thing by the city. So um, they deserve kudos as well. So thanks again, that's it. Excellent. And um, thank you. I will make just a quick comment here, um, touch basing on or uh, touching based on what uh, what Chuck had mentioned, um, being part of the um, the all sports uh, committee for a year and and to see absolutely to, to second that point that um, all the different sports were really uh, four square behind this project. And it's really exciting to see where we are now. And uh, I can't imagine how much more exciting it will be when we see our first uh, match. That would be amazing. I hope we can all be there. That's all I have. So moving right along, let's look at commission reports. That is our time. And um, I'm first up on the list, uh, pedestrian or bicycle, pedestrian and trails committee. We don't have anything yet. We have a meeting later this month. So we have nothing on the current schedule. A uh, community of character. The community of character has uh, chosen the three recipients uh, for um, the scholarships and from Amador and Foothill. And uh, I believe this week will be a press release um, uh, of the three three students um absolutely amazing absolutely amazing um, um one is a foster child um student 
foster child. And another comes from a, a very low income family that this will really help uh, the family. So um, once you read the their bios, it, you will be amazed at, at how they are such uh, stunning students. So that's it. You forgot, uh, you forgot about the Martin Luther King event. Oh. That is first time I attended that event. I can see so much of positivity and so much of collaboration between the cities. And it's an, one amazing event. Uh, I want to, I'm really proud to be part of it and looking forward for many great events like that. Um, yeah, I, you know, time goes by so quickly. And the Martin Luther King breakfast was absolutely wonderful. Uh, just the recipients uh, from the different cities one being um, the um, Thanksgiving uh, uh, dinner done by St. Raymond's Church. Uh, it's all free to anyone who wants to come. And I helped uh, do the setting of the tables and stuff, which was great fun. And then um, Ronnie Mack, who uh, was a, a Vietnam vet, um, suffered from um, the um, aftermath of uh, any war, uh, started a um, homeless uh, a food pantry outlet. And uh, I'm trying to think of the third person. Can't, uh, but. Um, three very deserving winners. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just amazing. Oh, Kelly Paducah. And um, Portland's um, gift and our loss. So anyway, it, it, I, I would really encourage anyone and everyone to um, go to this breakfast. It's a, a super uh, eye-opener and it deals with the Tri-Valley. So it's Dublin, Livermore and Pleasanton. So very good. Thanks for Mesh for reminding me. Excellent. Heritage Tree Review Board, that's mine. We have not had a uh, meeting since the last one. Public Art Selection Subcommittee. Nothing. And Sports Council. It's the meeting early January, which I reported on last meeting. Okay. Um, I'd like to take a moment here to um, to recognize somebody here in the commission that um, will be stepping aside. Um, since I've been on this commission, she has been um, just rock solid, instrumental in 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 allowing me to grow on this commission. And and I'm speaking of Joni Fields, eight years on this commission, um, and from this is I think my second or third year, I can't remember, time flies so fast, but um, you're so detailed, you're so engaged, you're so involved in our community, and you're going to be missed so much on this commission. But as I said to you the other day, um, we expect you to be around, and we expect you to be here contributing um, as a member of our community. So um, as you're stepping away, you're not away from us. And every decision that we make, I'm sure that we're going to have your voice um, in our ear, in our mind, and I'm sure we'll be seeing emails from you as well, communicating with us effectively, as you have been um, since I've been on this board, on this commission. And in recognition, I do have something here for you. Um, you can open it now or later. It's something, it's not seize candy. Thank you very much. She, she, had, she, she saw this box and she said seize candy. No, it's not. No, it's not. Thank you. It would be nice to open it now. I think it would be nice for the public to uh, to, to gain an understanding of this. And it's something on behalf of the uh, the entire commission. So, Mike, uh, can I say a few words when yes, while please. she's opening? Oh, yeah. And uh, I want to share my experience uh, with Joni. I always, uh, I always call her for any questions, right? Uh, before the meeting or after the meeting saying that uh, Joni helped me out. Uh, 
how, what do I do? How do I present myself? She calls me if I miss any of the community of character meeting. You're such a dumb to miss these meetings and all that, right? Uh, I look forward to kind of same mentorship, no matter where you are, Joni. I look for I look after for you to help me guide through this, right? We are like, I know we most of us are new to this, and uh, you went through so many committees and so many commissions, right? And I look forward uh, to for your guidance and your mentorship for coming years. Thanks a lot for being there. Whenever I call you, she, first thing she tells me, who the heck are you? <laughs> I, I, every time I say, I'm a 27-year resident of Pleasanton, and I give the same introduction every time before I call her. Right? <laughs> but but uh, I hope you still respond to my messages and uh, keep your like uh, guiding me uh, through what I'm doing irrespective of I'm here on the commission or not, I'll be looking forward for your guidance all the time. Thank you. I I'm, I have to answer to that one. Uh, when I get a text and there's only a telephone number there, I don't know who the person is. So it was yesterday and I said, I'd gladly give you 10 minutes, but who the heck are you? <laughs> So thank you all. Um, eight years really went by really quick. I um, had applied for several of the different commissions and um, uh, the late Jerry Thorne kept refusing me. And so um, this is the one I, I said, this is my last go. I'm, I'm going to try to get on this one. I think I know more about this department than anything else. And so I was lucky in which to get it. And my, the first uh, director was Susan Andrade Wax. And um, if and I don't think any of you other than Chuck uh, had worked with her and she was a very strong um, individual and known throughout the state. Um, a very good guiding force. And then, of course, Heidi. And um, I found out that I really didn't know that much. Um, the, um, I was given a, um, a, a tour of the majority of our parks um, by a former uh, employee. And um, I found out that I didn't know half of the parks that we have and how much work is done in each one. And of course, I, during, and I've never felt that we have done enough. I have never felt that we have met the challenges of our community. And that's only because of me. Uh, looking back, it's it's been the Cubby Park. It's been um, part of the Bernal. It's been all the renovations in all the, um, you know, community parks. It's been the, pi the Purple Pipe. It's been um, all these things. And a lot of it dealing with Matt. And I would... I would love to, you know, and the art that's been put up and all the renovations that have been made. It's, it's, it's sad for me uh, to be leaving, but I think probably on a Thursday night, I, I might be sitting out there and putting, giving Edith a card because I want to talk about something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and also the cookies. Yeah, here you two before you go to bed. But, go. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I, I, I kind of think this. I don't know if my husband's going to really react to uh, this. 
<laughs> it has an inscription of over yes. years of service. Over and, years of service yes. on it inscribed. And I started in in, in 2015. So um, hopefully the rest of you learn more about our community and um, think about everyone that's going to be involved, not just a certain group. And don't just listen to the uh, noisiest people. You have to answer to yourself and you have to answer to the community, but mostly if you're answering to yourself, you're answering to those people and everybody's worth it. So thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you, Joni. Can I quickly jump in and then um, I have something to hand you to Joni. It has been so much fun to work with Joni because you always know what Joni is thinking. You never have to guess. <laughs> No filters. <laughs> no, no filters. filters. She's yeah. going to let you know exactly what she's thinking. And I think um, that's a relationship that works really well for commissioners to come forward and, and share what you're truly thinking, what are you hearing from the community and asking the hard questions makes us all better, makes our community better. So thank you for making us all better, Joni. Really, really grateful to have had this time to work with you. And I, like everyone else, do expect to see you. I expect to see you in the library. I expect to see you out in the parks. I expect to see you at community events and hopefully here in the council chamber. So I, the, the Zoom people aren't going to be able to hear me, but I'm going to um, give you your, your, your plaque to go with your gavel. Perfect. Well, let's wrap this up. And, um, and then I would like Joni at the end, there is a little pad in there too, to, to gavel us out. How about that? That would be a great use of that, uh, that gavel first use. <laughs> okay. Uh, future agenda items, <clears throat> skate park. We actually talked about that tonight and we see now with our new format, um, some of these things will, you know, fade away or they'll be resurrected at some other point. Uh, doggy bags are still dear to my heart. Can I well, offer a recommendation on the doggy bags and cubbies dog yes. park restroom that you all might not appreciate? Um, <laughs> but I'm going to put it out there anyways for your consideration. Sure. These two items are really new things that are not on the capital improvement budget or on the city council's work plan. Would you be okay with us just putting these in a parking lot until after the strategic plan is sense. done? It makes sense. And then we might get input from the public that pushes it one way or another exactly so if you're okay with that i think, I think that aligns a lot better with our new process well the, those doggy bags have been put off since uh joe strain was a uh commissioner and actually back in the 1990s when dolores bingston was the director and you know responsible they, dog owners should be bringing their own dog bags in well so. and they could do like they do at shadow cliffs and there's a place that you can put extra bags there and so that might be something for the commission to think about no, but I, I, I do recall though i will i will push in here that there we do have several parks in our city that do have the containers and the dispensers they, and so a survey of that i am hopeful for that we would see that to see what we actually are doing at this point and my objective with was doggy with doggy bags would be in our um in our showcase park so we have them in some satellite parks and would, that's that, i that was my believe request. those parks are not part of the city's um venue i think those are private parks with hmos h h h o a yeah i do think though they're in our dog parks yeah so they oh. are in the dog parks okay so we do have them. okay let me just say one more thing Joni you can say anything else you want at this point and I will keep my <laughs> mouth quiet okay is that it no okay. Mike Mike I have a question Steve go ahead yeah one one last thing so uh for future items I guess my question is when's the time frame when we start speaking about the strategic plan um because I didn't I couldn't find that in my notes 
Yeah, I think that is is definitely still unclear. So Steve, our intention with the strategic plan as we build it is that you're going to be part of the community process. So that community budget survey, that you're going to come to those outreach events um, and that we will bring you a draft strategic plan as it starts to unfold on its way to city council. So that draft will come to you for feedback and input. It'll go to city council for final approval. And then um, I think from there, we build that implementation action plan or and or the implementation action plan comes to you as part of the strategic plan that you weigh in on before it goes to city council. I'm not sure on the okay. nuance of that timing, but yeah, I'm we thinking, can work with you. Yeah, we can work yeah, with you when we do that. I, I just want to make sure it doesn't get lost in the shuffle with this Staples Ranch discussion. I think it's warrants some type of future agenda item at some point in time. And I don't know when that time is, so. I hear you. So definitely let's get through the strategic planning process first, see where we land um, and how that is gonna work out with budget priorities as well. I know that um, council is looking at um, starting to look at this next two year budget. And then um, once the strategic plan's done, I believe there'll be some budget adjustments perhaps at midterm or for the next two year budget cycle. Okay, great, thanks. Um, for for future agenda, one was was the um, comments from the the ladies that were here and about that strip and about um, are we is that take are you taking that back, um, Mike, to the um, bicycle pedestrian? Yes, and, and I'm sorry, we didn't we didn't title her correctly. She is on that on that committee. Okay. Yes, she is on that committee, and that is something that will definitely it's 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 moving higher up on their concern list. So that's something we'll be sharing back into the system. Okay. I think it's it's something, and we know that it's an issue with zone seven and the city and, and the use of it and who takes responsibility. And once we touch it, we own it for life. And that's really okay. the big issue at okay. this point. Okay, great. And then I, I thought we had a future agenda item around field allocation or something in that. You do. Um, okay. <laughs> you do. Okay. It's, it it's likely going to be coming. Um, probably this summer. So I, I think we just probably dropped it by mistake because of the spacing. That's what it looks like. Maybe it just didn't fit, um, but it should be coming to you this summer looking at our field allocations. That would be good to put in here because that doesn't necessarily have money attached to it. So, you know, <laughs> you won't tell. Right. Right. <laughs> yay. <laughs> That's true. Very good Perfect. Point. Yeah. Okay. So our hope is to get it to sports council like in June and then here after that. So that's our tentative planning on the timing for that. Very good. Well, um, we are at that time of the evening. It is, uh, what is it? Just after nine o'clock. Not bad. Um, I'm looking for somebody to make a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? I'll second. Joni, I would like you to gavel us out. This meeting is adjourned.